aka Toy Fans, Scott Toy Guru Nightlick here. I uh, woke up this morning and I saw an interesting post on one of my my favorite sites about Star Wars figures, and you, everyone knows I'm a huge Star Wars action figure collector. In addition to having worked in the industry on a lot of collector product, this post in particular was about a uh, petition to bring back the vintage collection of three and three-fourth Star Wars figures. And they were between 5,000 and 7,000 su subscribers or, or, or petitioners, if you will. And it got me thinking, I wanted to sort of put out a video putting a little bit of this into perspective to maybe add a little insight. So a vendor, a, a, a company that makes product like this, like an action figure, also makes things like this, like baby bottles and plastic cups and plastic bowls. In other words, a company that's set up to make a plastic action figure can basically make plastic anything. A lot of the same vendors that are making the action figures that we all love and collect are also in another room making baby bottles or making, you know, plastic forks or you know, any basically anything made of plastic, essentially, because if they have injection molding machines, they're set up to do that that type of type of type of business. And all of this product is essentially made in the same way with injection molding machines and then put together along assembly lines. Now, action figures are a little bit more difficult to make because they have more assembly than, say, something like a baby bottle. So because of this, you could understand if you are a factory owner with an injection molded plastic factory, you probably much prefer to make forks and bowls versus action figures because they're just logistically easier to make. They don't take assembly. It's just a, uh, a one-time punch out of the plastic. So that's kind of a baseline. But it also very much plays into production numbers. Now, this is not proprietary information, and I'm not going to talk about production numbers for any specific toy line, but it's absolutely public knowledge that most vendors overseas in China that make plastic have a minimum production quota of about 5,000 units. Now, that doesn't mean they don't prefer orders for 100,000 units, but they pretty much won't produce something unless they have that type of minimum order. You can get that from just calling them on the phone and asking them what their minimum order is. Now, there are ways around this, and I'm not talking about any specific toy line. Yes, I know I've got a shot of me with the Masters of the Universe figures, but Sometimes when working around low production runs, you can do this by basically charging more. You can pay the vendor a lot more money, and the vendor will agree to produce under their minimum production quota for you and give you fewer than they're you know, set up to do or they're normally willing to do for clients, but they're going to charge you a lot more for that. And because of that, a company would then charge more. This is why a lot of action figures and collector lines cost more, because they're paying the vendor more for a lower production run. So, you know, back when Motu Classics came out, a Marvel Legends figure sold for about $10, but the original price for Motu Classics was about $20, about double the price of sort of the equivalent at retail. Although it's interesting, flash forward today, and a Marvel Legends figure actually does cost $20 at retail. And part of that is just inflation and the cost of plastic, which is tied to the cost of oil. And that's a whole other YouTube video entirely. But the point I'm making is the reason that some collector figures cost more is because of that minimum order quota. And that's why the subscriptions were so important on Maddie Collector why we needed to hit the minimum we did because it was all tied back to how much essentially we were going to pay the vendor to produce these figures either over or under their given quota. So here's another example. Here is a pitcher of water. Let's say that this pitcher of water represents the amount of energy it takes to make a toy, any toy. Because honestly, whatever toy you're making takes about the same amount of pre-production work. Whether it's a Barbie doll, or a He-Man figure, or a Star Wars figure, or a G.I. Joe, or a My Little Pony, 
it basically takes the same amount of work on the back end from design and package development and legal and marketing to make that toy. All right, so you're going to start with the same amount of energy, amount of water, if you will. So now let's say you have two glasses. One glass represents something like, say, Hot Wheels, where you're going to make and sell millions and millions of units. The other glass represents a, sort of call it a low production run collector line, like, say, Masters of the Universe Classics, or even Star Wars Black Series. Something that doesn't sell as much as something like Hot Wheels to millions and millions around the world. Well, as a toy company, you have to decide where do you pour your energy? Do you pour it in the Hot Wheels glass, the G.I. Joe glass? Well, actually, G.I. Joe's not at retail now, bad example. Or do you pour it into the collector glass? So if you pour it into the Hot Wheels glass, you're going to sell millions and millions of Hot Wheels and make, uh, you know, ideally millions of dollars, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The same amount of energy you could pour into making a collector line, like say the Black Series, which you know I don't have access at their production numbers or their sales numbers, but I'm guessing they are lower overall than Hot Wheels. Now you're going to say, oh, this is just a money grab. You know, toy companies are just out there to make all this money, and they don't care about us. They just want money, 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 money. They should be you know pouring their water glass into everything and having more glasses of water. Well. Toy companies have to answer to their stockholders, the people who have invested in the company and given them money up front in order to pay their bills. Toy, you know, toy companies aren't making these decisions in the dark. They are, for the most part, publicly traded companies. And any publicly traded company needs to think about this. Now, of course, we're on the collector side saying, well, I've been supporting your Spider-Man line for years, and, you know, you, I deserve more Spider-Man figures because I've been supporting it, and you owe me figures. Well, yes, as collectors, we tend to think of ourselves as the center of the universe because, you know, we are awesome, and we do support these lines, and we have for years, sometimes paying out tons of money. So here is a really good example. The 12-inch G.I. Joe. Very popular for... 40 years, launched in the 60s, hugely popular with adult collectors. There's G.I. Joe Con, you know, on and on. The 12-inch format is kind of the the bread and butter. And a friend of mine, Daryl DePriest, who worked for Hasbro for years, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have known him through the industry, he is a huge G.I. Joe fan, and he managed the G.I. Joe line at Hasbro for a long time, and he managed sort of the collector 12-inch. So I want to read you an interview he said here. Hasbro is a big company with shareholders. We can't make everything that we want to. We have to put our design resources where they're going to be most productive. Unfortunately, the economy of scale of G.I. Joe, especially 12-inch, doesn't make it. Furthermore, but the sales tapered off of 12-inch. And what they showed Hasbro senior management is that the 12-inch business really was a very niche business in the world of boys' toys. So we had to shut it down. Sales didn't sustain it. And I'm sorry to say, years later, the situation really hasn't changed. 12-inch collecting has a small but passionate fan base. And it's not significant enough for Hasbro to devote design resources. I use this example because it's not a toy line I worked on. And I wanted to specifically show that this is industry-wide. So while we should be very thankful for the collector toys that we can get, feeling like a company sort of owes it to us because we've been supporting the line for years, the reason I'm bringing this up is I'm not trying to you know, be negative or bring everyone down, but it's more about kind of having gratitude for what we can get and... I guess, shall we say, having reasonable expectations for what we can't get. As a personal example, I love Darkhawk. He's one of my favorite Marvel heroes, and I was so excited when they finally made a Marvel Legends figure. But that figure wasn't quite the Darkhawk I wanted. It was not 1991 Darkhawk. Uh, it had the wrong wrist gauntlet, the wrong color amulet, uh, the detailing on the belt was different. It was kind of a mix match of modern Darkhawk and 91 Darkhawk. It wasn't really either one. It was like an amalgam of both of them. And this really wasn't the Darkhawk I wanted. I wanted 1991 Darkhawk. And of course, it further you know, broke my heart when 
Action Figure Insider revealed that Toy Biz was going to do a 1991 Darkhawk if the line had continued. Huge shout out to Action Figure Insider for putting the slideshow together. They're awesome. This was the Darkhawk I wanted. And because they made a Darkhawk in the, the current Hasbro line, I'm probably not going to get this version. This is kind of the Darkhawk I'm going to have to sort of accept. So let's bring it back to how I started this video with uh, the Star Wars Vintage line, which had a, uh, a, a poll out where you know, five to 7,000 people signed it saying they want more. And I know I'm a, vint I'm a collector of the Vintage line, and I know when you see toy lines out there in the same brand that are in a different scale, the question is, well, why are you making a different scale? Why aren't you making you putting this energy into the scale I already collect? And the answer is sales. I mean, companies, these big publicly traded companies need to make money in order to pay for the licenses, to pay for their overhead. A lot of the disconnect, and I found this from being in the industry, is the internet tends to make fan voices louder than they are numerous. Yes, we are passionate. We are awesome, awesome people. But the nature of the internet and the way it works tends to amplify our voices. As an example, I had Mattel once do an analysis of a fan site to see how many unique posters were posting in a month. There were, you know, thousands of posts on this site over 30 days, and I said, how many are there? And the answer was 28. There were 28 individual unique users on posting on this site, but they were responsible for generating thousands and thousands of posts. This is a perfect example of how the internet can magnify fan voices. All right, so what's the conclusion of all this? How do we vote with our dollars, which is what everyone says, especially when a company that we want to give our money to is making a product that we may not want? And they have the ability to make a product we do want, which is where the frustration comes from. So how in the world do you resolve this? Honestly, sometimes it's just about accepting the fact that we can't have everything we want. You, you know, the whole eat, have your cake and eat it too. Yes, sometimes you can, but sometimes, especially with the internet, having realistic expectations is going to lead to less heartbreak. Now, the other side of the coin is when a company does offer something magnificent and amazing for collectors, you need to support it because this tells companies that we do want things like this. When, you know, Kickstarter-esque projects or, you know, these really crazy, awesome collector items are offered, well, when they don't go through, when they fail, it basically sends the message to companies, okay, well, this is a revenue base that's not worth it you do vote with your purchase. I mean, that's absolutely true. And I know it's frustrating when you can't get product you want to buy, but a lot of that does come back to those production numbers. A, comp a, a vendor in China, you know, as much as we may love something, they have to look at the money first over producing something for love. Producing for something for love where you're going to lose money as both a vendor or a company is a tough pill to swallow. We are very passionate, the adult collector, but at the end of the day, there are fewer of us than we may realize. But it doesn't mean we can't make the impossible possible. We can. You just have to sort of accept that the internet magnifies our voices and sometimes can create a disconnect between how many of us there are versus the production numbers a company needs to hit. If you like this video, if you have questions, you want to follow up or anything like that, let me know in the comments below. Subscribe, give me a thumbs up, and I'll uh, see you guys around the internet.